Across America, BP supports more than 275,000 jobs to keep energy flowing. Jobs like expanding capacity for biodiesel in Washington state and reducing operational emissions in the Gulf of Mexico. It's and, not or. See what doing both means for energy nationwide at bp.com slash investing in America. The stress and crowds of holiday shopping can put a damper on your holiday spirit, and you don't always find all the perfect gifts you're looking for. The Virginia Lotteries games make easy and tremendously fun gifts for all the adults in your life. Even you. Spruce up your gift-giving game this holiday season with the Virginia Lottery. The Virginia Lottery's holiday scratchers are a gift any adult will love. Treat yourself to some winter wonderment and play the Lottery's holiday online instant games from anywhere in Virginia. Visit valottery.com slash holiday. Please gift responsibly. Lottery games are not for minors. Hey, it's Ryan Holiday, host of the Daily Stoic Podcast. When I bought my first house in 2013, part of the way I paid for it was we would rent it out on Airbnb in Austin when there was South by Southwest or F1 or ACL. And then later when that tiny little house became my office, I would work there, I'd do my writing during the week. Then on the weekends, we'd rent it out to people who were coming in from out of town on Airbnb. And you may be sitting on an Airbnb and not even know it. You've probably had the same experience. You stayed in an Airbnb and thought, this is doable. Maybe I could rent my place on Airbnb. And it's really that simple. You can start with a spare room or you can rent your whole place. Maybe you're traveling to see friends and family for the holidays. While you're away, your home could be an Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out at airbnb.com slash host. Content warning, this episode gets into discussion of mental health as well as the murder of two girls. You may have heard of Jason Blair in any number of different contexts. For one thing, he's an active and insightful commentator in social media on a variety of true crime-related issues. But the first thing that comes up online about him might very well be the end of his brief career at the New York Times. He resigned from that paper back in 2003, after it was revealed he had plagiarized and fabricated material in his articles. That experience seems to have helped him grow, healing himself, and then using his empathy and compassion for others to help them as well. He became a certified life coach to aid others in helping them reach their full potential. He also hosts the Silver Linings Handbook Podcast, an interview-based podcast where he talks with interesting people about a variety of topics. Given Jason's interests, it's not surprising that true crime subjects come up fairly regularly. We always appreciate it when we see Jason's comments about true crime. Not only is he insightful, but he always seems to want to offer grace and understanding to people, even if those people are attacking those Jason cares about. For all of those reasons, we decided to reach out to Jason for a conversation about what's been going on in the Delphi case recently. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're the Murder Sheet. And this is a conversation with Silver Landings Handbook podcast host Jason Blair about the Delphi murders, true crime, and empathy. You told us that you have a bit of a bias in this case. Can you uh, describe what that means? Yeah, you know, I do have a strong bias. I've been pretty open about it on social media that I'm very skeptical of the defense theory. And, you know, when I hear hooves, I think horses, right? Not zebras and certainly not unicorns. And this is a bit of a unicorn story. What we know from statistics about murder is that if a white woman or two white women are murdered, it's like they're likely to be killed by a white man, local, 
And despite what <clears throat> many people think, it's likely to be a sole perpetrator. That's what the data tells us. If you look at any crime and you, you sort of build a triangle, you've got your victimology on one end. So that's the availability, the desirability, and the vulnerability of the victim. And then on another end of the triangle, you've got the crime scene. That's the evidence you found. And what you're trying to do is take those things and get the perpetrator to fit into the other end. And, you know, crime scenes don't lie. Victimology doesn't lie. Perpetrators do. So you've got to, like, you know, grain of salt with some of what your uh, supposed perpetrator says. But as long as, in my mind, right, the obvious suspects have been eliminated, right, the people who know them very well, so we move from horses to zebras, but we don't jump to unicorns. And right now, I feel Richard Allen is the zebra in this story. It's not as common as it being someone close to the people, but it makes sense. And on my end, it's basic, like, Oxum's razor stuff, right? When you have two competing ideas that explain a phenomenon, you pick the one that contains the smallest number of elements. And when you excluded all those simple explanations when you've excluded the ordinary you look for the extraordinary and we are not at least in my mind there yet really really well said <laughs> and yeah i like the, the the horses to zebras to unicorns i i suppose uh that i could definitely see unicorn elements in in what the defense has laid out um at this point here's a really broad question what did you think of the frank's memorandum well on one level i actually honestly thought that there was some brilliance to it. And, and by that, I mean, we're trying to balance a bunch of constitutional, moral, and ethical principles here. There's the First Amendment right to a free press, which benefits all of us. There's the Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights that sort of protect against search and seizure, you know, the right to a public trial, the right to, I guess, confront witnesses and have ze zealous legal representation. And one of the things that happens in most criminal cases that get a lot of media attention is the prosecution gets to tell their story first through the probable cause affidavit, through an indictment. There's this cleverness in the sense that the defense found a way found a vehicle, it may not have been the appropriate vehicle, to tell an alternative story. And part of that, I honestly think, is their job to do, right? Primarily in the courtroom. But we all know and we recognize that a lot of what's happening right now is really meant for the media. And if it's meant for the media, the real reason a defense attorney should or a prosecutor should try and send the message is because of its impact on the jury pool. So on some levels, I, I really like it, but there, on another level, I have, I think, in my mind, significant problems with it. Like defense attorneys do have this responsibility to defend their client and share alternative theories, but this really doesn't do that. It doesn't accomplish that. It's not exculpatory. Everything in the defense memorandum could be absolutely true, and Richard Allen could still be the guy who did it. I think it's probably going to backfire with any reasonable judge, because they're probably not going to take most of what you do seriously anymore when you start talking about unicorns and radioactive yetis. And I think another piece, that, and, and that does not help your client, that actually harms your client. I think it also reeks of desperation. And some in the jury pool are going to think, like I do, that if you have to come up with a conspiracy theory that explains away confessions, explains away your client being there and involves a ritualistic sacrificing cult, then you're really having a hard time explaining what's there. So I think on some levels, it's short-term game for the defense because they get a lot of media attention. That impacts the jury pool. But over the long term with the judge and probably the public as this starts to fall apart, but certainly the jury, right? Because there are things that could probably, at least what I've been told, there's some things in there that are just flat out mischaracterizations of, um, of what law, different law enforcement folks have said. 
Well, if they continue with this theory of trial, a lot of that can be refuted and it may end up ultimately having the opposite effect. So yes, zealous rep representation for the defendant, but I'm not so sure the defense is serving the defendant's best interest. You mentioned um, the, the role of the media here, and obviously this is a case that has gotten a ton of media coverage. And I know in recent years, rightfully so, there's been a lot of debate about, you know, what is responsible media coverage in an ongoing case and, and sort of true crime media in general. And I sort of think, how do you view the role of media coverage in the Delphi case now as we are sort of hurtling to trial, um, especially given that at least the defense seems to acknowledge that it can be a powerful tool to help them craft an alternate narrative? Yeah, and I think it goes back to that point about balancing all these principles, those constitutional ones for the defendant, for the public, particularly his you know, right to a fair trial, right to a public open trial, where authorities can be held <coughs> accountable for, for protecting his rights. But there's also a moral obligation to the victims, right? Justice for the victims. Um, it may not be in the Constitution. You're not going to find anywhere in the Constitution where it says, like, you know, justice for victims is a is a right, but we have a moral obligation for that. We have a moral obligation towards their uh, families, not just for justice, but the way that we treat them. And one of the things that I learned really early in my career, by the time I was like a cub reporter, I went off to this program and I learned it from every editor afterwards. I went to this program at the Pointer Institute for Journalism Studies, and we were talking about when you tell a story and you have a fact that is not necessary to tell the story, but it may give a little color. It may help paint the picture for people. The question you should always ask yourself, and this probably plays with law and journalism, but the question that you really should ask yourself is which option does the least amount of harm, including it or not including it? And I think part of what's happened is we are in this world right now and, you know, I, I, I have a podcast. I benefit from us not having as many gatekeepers. Lord knows, I definitely benefit from us not having as many gatekeepers. But all of that said, without um, gatekeepers, I think you have a lot of YouTube creators, podcast hosts, other folks who we have to consider as a part of the mass media, even if they aren't traditional journalists, who have a rudimentary understanding of journalism, a rudimentary understanding of how you confirm facts, and a rudimentary understanding of um, ethics and that idea of what would do harm. And I can think back to my career. You know, there were definitely times where we would find out a detail about a story, like let's say the caliber of a bullet or something like that. The police wanted it held back, and we held it back because it served nothing. Us telling our readers that it was a 22 did nothing. Maybe if we were doing a story on like, I don't know, the growth of the use of 22s and murders, then it would be a fundamental part of it. And I can think of times where there, it's like an, one in particular where, you know, this victim had a very agonizing death. It was just a brutal death. It was not necessary to tell the story. The family did not need to know those details. So we didn't do it. I feel the same way about things like names of witnesses before they become relevant. But the, we have creators now who are competing for eyeballs and they're, you know, trying to get clicks on things. And I think one of the things that happens, you know, and a great example from the defense memorandum are the side by sides, you know, people who are posting pictures of the new supposed suspects and the video that Libby had taken. Well, that does harm. It does real harm to that person who has not been charged with anything. And the traditional media, we wouldn't even, good old days, we wouldn't even be mentioning his name. And it does real harm to him and his family. And guess what? It's for an audience of people who are not gonna be the nine jurors. Who cares what Jason Blair thinks about whether this dude looks like the person who was on the video. And, and, and I say all this to say, knowing that environment, um, I think the defense has really taken advantage of the fact that there aren't gatekeepers. If you look at their memorandum, the first 104 pages 
I think it was 104. 104 pages are this wild conspiracy theory. I will not even say the word, but wild conspiracy theory, um, totally unnecessary to a Frank's motion, which is really focused on did law enforcement deceive, either by omission or commission, deceive a judge to get a search warrant. I have no idea what their conspiracy theory has to do with that. But it makes for a great narrative, makes for great headlines, make, makes for lots of clicks. So, and, and, and here's a point where it does a disservice to their client. On page 105, they start talking about law enforcement, they have a 136-page memo, law enforcement potentially deceiving the judge. Well, that is kind of relevant, but you buried it under all this crap that's not going to help you with the you know, help you with the judge and others who are looking at it at all as a part of that document. And if I were the judge on the other side and I'm not a judge, I'd be like, if you are crazy enough to believe this, then I am going to discount anything else you say. And so, but they know that environment, right? And they put in these graphic details about Abby and Libby's uh, bodies and their deaths, some of which are wholly speculative if you look at the full footnotes. But they know it tells a good story. They know people are going to post it. They're going to talk about it. And it's going to spread this alternative theory or maybe make their lifetime movie or whatever it is they're attempting to accomplish. I've got to tell you, like, it's on the flip side. I know we've always felt behind the scenes that we're very grateful that there are no gatekeepers because that allows us to be podcasters and kind of. Yeah. Our own. Yeah. So, I mean, we are in the same boat as you in that sense. And then at the same time, the lack of gatekeeping in this case um, has been worsened by the fact that it has been so secret for so long. And yeah. I can understand where law enforcement mm -hmm. was coming from. Like, we can't divulge because then, you know, it could hurt the case. But at the same time, when you don't give the media outlets anything to run with that's real, then everybody goes to YouTube or podcasts or, you know, maybe Reddit for information and while there might be people in all of those spaces who are doing a really good job or, or, you know, just trying to trying their best, there's also a lot of misinformation in those spaces yeah. and no way to like, no accountability at all. Oh yeah. 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 And I think part of the problem is that in a very big news story, the, you know, the media relations people will tell you like the worst thing that can happen is a vacuum because the vacuum is going to get filled with speculation, conspiracy theories, stuff that's problematic. And I think a lot of law enforcement have a hard time balancing, you know, not having a vacuum without doing things that will harm their investigation or, or that they feel will make them look bad or whatever it is. But I think law enforcement agencies need to get better at telling the continuous story without sort of like creating a vacuum or harming. And some large agencies, you can see, are very, very good at it. They are very skilled, but they tend to be in the big media market. But one of the things about gatekeepers on it, and Kevin, part of the reason why I gravitated to your podcast is you did that gatekeeping for yourself without any editors. You stuck to ethics. You stuck to good journalism. And that's what sort of drew me to you guys originally. So, you know, maybe that's part of the answer. Now that there aren't gatekeepers, it's our responsibility as the people who create to do that ethical application ourselves. And I think people are very ill-prepared to do it. They're not necessarily incentivized to do it. But I do have a theory about that. And I think we've, we've seen it. You know, you can just look in the true crime podcasting community. There are people who play fast loose with the truth, right? There are people who steal people's stuff. There are people who do all sorts of like wacky stuff. And in, 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 in the true crime community, you get people who rise and rise and they're getting lots of clicks and they're saying outlandish stuff that's getting a lot of attention. But ultimately, those same listeners who listen to them because they always had these interesting things end up not trusting them. So those people have like huge rises and fall. And there's a reason why the New York Times is still here. There's a reason why the Wall Street Journal is here. There's a reason why the Washington Post is still here. Because beyond them getting it first, we collectively, for the most part, not all of us, but most of us, trust them. Trust them. And I think it's a very short-sighted thing for a creator to just throw everything out there without vetting and throw out conspiracy theories. Because while it might work 
for you now, you're not going to be standing in the long run. You're eventually going to have your little scandal. You're eventually going to have a trust issue. So. Yeah, people lose interest then because it's like, wait, am I just, is this just mindless entertainment with like maybe a tinge of facts occasionally? In that case, what am I doing essentially? Right. Because people don't think about it this way, but really the reason why we gravitate to these things is we want to know what really happened. Sure, we want to be entertained. Sure, we want this. We don't think about that part, but we really want to know what happened. And being sort of jerked back and forth is not a... Eventually, I just say, okay, you are not a reliable narrator, so why am I listening to you? Let me go listen to... Yes. Oh, my gosh. I feel like you're saying everything that's, like, in our heads about this, like, media environment. <laughs> At The Murder Sheet, we spend so much time digging into crime stories that sometimes it's difficult to find the time to plan out and cook elaborate, nutritious meals. That's why we are so excited about our sponsor, Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. Our sponsors make this podcast possible. So if you go to factormeals.com slash msheet and use our special code msheet, you're not just getting half off this high quality meal plan. You're supporting us too. So I'm obsessed with Factor. I had their creamed corn chicken and their tomato basil chicken risotto recently. Both were delicious. That risotto in particular was amazing. Plus, the whole process was a breeze. All I had to do was pop the meal into the microwave. The food was tasty and flavorful, which is no surprise given that each recipe is specifically crafted by chefs and approved by dietitians. Having Factor during the hectic holiday season has been a boon, especially with us pumping out so many episodes. Head to factormeals.com slash msheet and use code msheet to get 50% off. That's code msheet at factormeals.com slash msheet to get 50% off. Have you heard? You can listen to your gripping investigations ad-free. Good news. With Amazon Music, you have access to the largest catalog of ad-free top podcasts included with your Prime membership. To start listening, download the Amazon Music app or visit amazon.com slash true crime ad free. That's amazon.com slash true crime ad free and catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Hey, listeners, this is Candace DeLong, the host of Killer Psyche. Imagine all your audio entertainment available in just one place. That's what the Audible app is all about. With Audible, you can always find the best of what you love or discover something new. Audible has an incredible selection of mystery and thriller titles and originals like Something Ain't Right by Roger and Zachary Stringer. The Space Within by Greg O'Connor and Josh Fagan, and Moriarty, an Audible original. Membership includes access to Audible originals, podcasts, and tons of audiobooks that you can download or stream as much as you want. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title per month from an ever-growing catalog of titles to keep. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, whether you're traveling, working out, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. New members can try Audible now for free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash DeLong or text DeLong to 500-500. Like truly. And like, this is one area where we're really fascinated to see what happens. And you know, it's funny, like people... People in television media often ask us or, you know, or like, hey, do you think they'll allow cameras in the Delphi case? Like, what do you guys think? And I always want to be like, why do we care? We're, we're audio people. Like, we're just, right, right. What will it matter? Our but right. I, shouldn't, I shouldn't think that way because it actually does affect all of us. We feel right. weird sometimes that you're getting things through our lens. So Kevin and I are both biased uh, in our own way. We are, you know, objectivity is a lovely idea, but it's a myth in reality because we're human beings. And mm -hmm. I might notice one detail that someone else doesn't notice, or I might put my own spin on it without meaning to. And, um, you know, TV would allow people to actually see what's going on. And yeah. then again, I read the TikTok effect of, as well. So it's kind of like, but I tend it cuts to both ways. <laughs> it totally cuts both ways. Because sometimes we're seeing what's going on and we, do, we have no idea what's going on. But um, so I think it's a, like, ideally for the audience, right? Not the people in the courtroom, but for the audience, you would get a little seeing it yourself, hearing it from a couple different people's perspectives. Without seeing it for yourself through television, I think ultimately what I would encourage people to do 
is listen to multiple people, read multiple people, put it all together, weigh it, and then you'll get to, to some idea. But I think one of the real complications is that there was a time where a defendant, now thinking about the defendant's protections, and before I say this, I recognize there are all sorts of complications with doing televised trials. Like you have to throw the camera at the ceiling when the jury comes in. You have to make sure it's not picking up audio during bench conferences. There are, you know, I saw one where, you know, the victim's bodies were accidentally shown on an overhead when the camera wasn't supposed to be looking. So it is, it is very difficult. It's going to be a long trial, but there was a day when we had robust local media and you know, in some cities, there were two or three plus newspapers. And so you got lots of different perspectives that covered all the, you know, all the different elements. Well, I can't say all, but many of the different important elements. Well, you know, a lot of local media, lo local areas are news deserts now. You know, they don't have newspapers anymore that publish daily. They may not have a television station that's nearby. And so in the absence of that, I think one of the great things when you're looking at the defendant's right to a public trial is that there's a broader group of media that has access to it that can hold people accountable. Like I, as the viewer, may not be able to, but you, as the reporter who sees it, who also knows these other elements, can be a part of that process of ensuring that there's a um, fair trial. Um, and it, it's just a, it's a tough balance because I look at those other pieces, like, you know, the defendant has a right to confront their accusers. Uh, the defendant has a right to also confront, for example, the witnesses that establish life and death. And some of those may be family members. And, you know, part of me just feels for all of them for what has to happen in this process, but I don't think it's a, um, you know, none of these rights or these moral things we're talking about are universally any stronger. You know, we need to find ways that they can work together and that they can be balanced. Yeah, very well said. And and I also, I love your point on things have changed and what was, what would have been, um, you know, an open trial back in the 70s, because as you said, you have three newspapers and a couple of TV stations they're not going to be there anymore. We've covered murder trials where we were the only media outlets there. And they were like, you know, like something that people in the town cared about. It wasn't like, it was just like, you know, a case that was forgotten. It was just that, you know, these, these local newspaper reporters are some of the hardest working people in the business. Oh yeah. Like doing say, that. 10, 12 stories a week. And so thinking about that environment, I think it's great that there are people who are, who are there. I think the hard part for the listeners and other people like that is how do I weigh who's doing the real reporting in the background versus just being speculative or trying to get attention. And that's where I say, listen to a lot of people, read a lot of different things and then weigh it for yourself. You can have things that seem very slick and I'm, I'm a long time true crime podcast listener. So I I've been in the boat of someone who's like, these people are really impressive. And then you look into it and you're like, and they may be over exaggerating how many cases they solved. <laughs> Yeah, the more I find out about true crime podcasting, the more disillusioned I become about true crime podcasting. <laughs> I am so jaded, Jason. I was, tell I, I was telling Kevin the other day, I was like, I feel like I came into this. I was like so bright eyed, like, you yeah, know, wow, true crime podcast. Oh, boy. And now I'm like, like smoking a cigarette, like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, well, the thing for me is that uh, I lucked out, right? I landed in the middle of a group of great ethical podcasters like the prosecutors and and others that are like them so um I, I i you know i'm a former journalist i as i say around me i'm a thinking man and i you know am exposed to those folks i hold everybody else up to a high standard and i don't think it's too high a standard because if you're going to get out there and do things that affect victims affect uh their families affect the defendant's constitutional rights, then you know what? You should be pretty good at it and you should be pretty honest and you should be pretty ethical. Otherwise, get off the court. Do something else. Which is really funny because I think a lot of it is fan fiction. It is. Oh, it's, uh, so much of Reddit is just, you know, I think, you know, based on, you know, like, based on nothing, based on my own, I made it up, you know, it, it's, 
and it's it's really it's gotten bad and i just hope i think people get it to a certain extent because we hear from a lot of listeners who seem to be like i was looking for something down the line and fact-based um i think sometimes you get into a situation where like you're so desperate for information that you'll Mm -hmm. like anything it's like a starving person i'll eat anything Mm -hmm. that's where you gotta get with delphi especially when it's been unsolved for all that time and then there's like fits and starts of information yeah, and that's a piece of advice to creators. Don't narrow your aperture to one case and think that you're going to like somehow produce all your content um, in one area. I had this um, editor who once told me, your Reddit comment made me think of this, editor who once told me that if anyone ever comes to you with a story that explains everything, don't believe it. So, you know, if you hear us unifying Stephen Hawking's theory of Ron Logan, Kagan Klein, Richard Allen, and a bunch of, you know, um, radioactive yetis, then just don't believe it. (laughs) It doesn't exist. Yes. Thank you. And it's like, oh my gosh. And just, I I feel like people want that uh, neatness. I think we're so influenced sometimes by crime fiction where you don't introduce an element in the second act, unless it's going to come full circle in the ending. But that's not how real life is. And yes, and real life does not operate like uh, like that at all. And I do think you're getting to a great point, Anya, that there is a human desire psychologically for narrative. Narrative helps us predict the future and feel more in control. It helps us understand the past. It helps us feel like there was a reason for all the bad things that happened. I think it's super powerful. But like watch Star Wars if you need that narrative. Like if you want to see the hero's journey, (laughs) Anakin, Darth Vader, redeem himself. Yes, right. But, you know, human life is is more messy. And I mean, I mean, that's part of what I I think do in my work right now. My mental health work is is a lot of about the messiness of of human life and but my podcasting is about the messiness of human life and how do we find inspiration in that and how do we find better ways to to do things and i find it's funny i find myself gravitating toward like those things no matter no matter what i'm doing i told you guys how i went out to idaho related to um an old old cold case it was very funny because i was like i want to find out more about the case see if I can like move the ball. And instead I end up being like a counselor for everybody who's there. I'm like, I'm worried whether you're like taking this too emotionally. And, and so I think no matter what environment I, I end up in, I have that appreciation for the messiness of life, for the competing motives that we have, for the fact that good people can do bad things. Certainly for my career, I, I wouldn't have survived if I didn't believe that. And that, messiness that part that doesn't make sense all of that stuff is just a part of the human condition and you can choose to look at it as a bad thing or you can choose to look at it as like a beautiful thing because when people navigate that to me it's much more beautiful than the simple narrative and i gotta say maybe maybe after delphi is all over you can come and maybe do some group therapy (laughs) maybe some other people because we might need it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a it's gonna be Home a, to indiana jason <laughs> and it's actually funny that you mentioned that piece of it i am um, i think you know just thinking about what you guys are doing and trying to keep your standards you know i think it's probably harder to talk about that other piece of it which you're emotionally deeply invested in all of these details i think people have a hard time you know, like it's one thing to cover a case like this and just throw stuff out there. But if you're really searching for the truth, that means you are immersed in the details of it. And that takes an emotional toll. When I was out in Idaho, like, I don't know, maybe an hour in, I was like, I got to pull aside this podcaster who's here because like, he's feeling this too deeply. Like he needs to, you know, encourage him to, I don't think he'd have any problem with me saying that, but you know, encourage him to step back. So I hope you guys are taking care of your mental health and stepping away from it every now and then. Oh, don't worry. We're definitely not doing that. No, okay. Well, you know, it's, I'm hard. Here. it's hard. It's hard. I'm here. Try. We help each other because I think we, if one of us is like getting cranky because it's like, yeah, 
yeah. we're, we're good about seeing, you know, sometimes we just need to go for a drive or a walk or um, step away, try to do a little like weekend getaway or something. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we keep each other balanced. I think if I was doing it alone, I would have a lot more trouble. And it, I mean, or vice versa. you'd probably have less trouble, frankly. But of course, um... <laughs> uh, the last time we took a weekend getaway, we got COVID. Yeah. So, so that's so... Not, <laughs> not always great. But I saw you guys on TV that week and you didn't seem like you had COVID. Oh, even with all the like disguised coughing. I remember one time Kevin was like mid swig into like a water bottle, like a Marco Rubio moment. And <laughs> yeah. thought that. I was... Hey, hey, it's great technique. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to say, watching you, following you on social media, listening to your podcast, some of the things you've said today, I'm going to say this awkwardly. But you seem to have a lot of compassion. You just seem to be very, very nice. There was a story recently even that you contributed generously to uh, a fundraiser for the family of uh, the Gilgo Beach killer. Alleged. Alleged Gilgo Beach uh, killer. How do, you, how do you find this well of compassion? And how do you do this and connect to other people the way you do? Yeah, so, that's a really good question. I think going through, I think there are probably a couple things. I'll give number one, my mom is a beautiful, wonderful altruist. And she raised her kids in a very, you know, very focused on helping people. And I've always been naturally curious. And there's this great long quote that I'm going to totally butcher. But it's essentially like if you could see in the depths of any man's heart, you find enough sorrow and sadness for forgiveness. So through my whole life, I've always tried to understand people. The, they may be the typical victim. They may be the typical hero. They may be the typical villain. But at some point, they were a little baby who was just trying to survive in this world. And so... I'm not Pollyanna-ish, right? Like, I don't think everyone's intentions are good, but I think everybody's deserving of my compassion. And I feel the exact same way. I think, I think a big catalyst for that was certainly what happened to me at the New York Times, and happened to me is really the wrong way to phrase it, because it's what I did at the New York Times, really was a humbling experience that helped me understand a lot of people that I had read about or seen who were suffering or who made horrible mistakes. And I came out of that experience and out of my recovery in general with just a deeper appreciation for people, the mistakes they make, the hurt they have. And if I can do a little bit, whether you're the lady at the airport today who worked at the airport and I let you cut in line so you could get coffee, it, because you work there or you're that person who I don't know I'm paying attention to you and I can tell you're sad or whatever it is I want to be able to give that back to people even the people I fight with on Twitter I try to be compassionate um and it's funny some of the people who fought with me the most have become some of the most friendly people <laughs> it's hard look Jason Ursay was on my podcast today and he said it's really hard to, essentially his point was, it's really hard to fight with someone when you're giving them, when you're holding hands. I say, when I'm hugging you, you might disagree with me, but it's really hard to get into a fight. Yeah, I, I was really struck how uh, you mentioned the prosecutors. It, it's, it's, a, it's a great podcast. Love the prosecutors. And a while ago, some people were, in in my opinion, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but in my opinion, were attacking Brad and Alice unfairly. Okay. And you talked about, even in a situation like that, just trying to show grace and understanding. And I found it inspirational. And also, to anyone listening, I certainly highly recommend checking out the podcast. Yeah. Your yeah. podcast. Thanks. I appreciate that. I think we get so passionate about things sometimes, and I think social media makes this harder it's really easy to throw out words that are harmful. And I think people don't understand on the other end of every creator or journalist or whatever is a real human being who, who feels those cuts. And social media does really make it easy in a way that when we're in person, people will never talk to each other. 
So I think an important thing is to just show a little bit more of that love on social media. So it's not a sort of desert of the things that we would never say in person. And I think I think that goes especially for all social media, but especially true crime, because I think there can be a lot of, um, you know, kind of very basic thinking about it. Like, you know, it, like people people need to realize that even the you know a witness who's being suddenly thrust into the spotlight, who's having their story picked apart, like that is a human being, and we all want to get justice we all want to solve the case or know what happened but ultimately like a bunch of people you know i saw this in the idaho murders it, with the university of idaho students everybody's on this sort of surviving roommates oh what how mm -hmm. why did they do this were they lying and it was like you know think back to when we were in college or at college aged and like maybe give some grace or you're oh, not like, on twitter gonna solve the mystery or bust it wide open you're just harassing like a young woman yeah, right. Because at the end of the day, it may be immaterial. It may be interesting or not. It's very, it's interesting you bring that up because my last day in Idaho, I spent in Moscow. Mm. Or is it Moscow? Moscow. Moscow, <laughs> Moscow yes. Um, and, you know, I, I was there because it was halfway between where I was in the, the airport. But I did decide to go around town and talk to some of the students and see what they were doing and just, you know, as a regular citizen. And I did decide um, to go to the house. And, you know, I'm so curious about the case, but instead of sort of like, I think, you think scoping the place out and, you know, trying to figure out the story, all I felt was just like an enormous amount of sadness and compassion for the people that were in there. And I don't care what they did. They didn't deserve this. They didn't deserve to be a part of this. They didn't deserve to be victims. And they're all victims, including the other two. And I think it's like that tactile thing. Um, and I think it goes back to like being in the same room with people and shaking their hands. Like, I want to see the person who goes to that, puts their hands in front of the flowers and talks crap about those girls because... Sit there and look at that house and tell me what you would have done. Tell me what's the appropriate thing to do in a situation like that. People need to be a lot less judgmental. That's right. By the way, that is what I want on my grave. I've told all the key people I believe who are going to live longer than me that I want. He didn't judge. That's what I want. I'm not going to judge people for what they do. That's really well said. And, and I, yeah, I can say when we went to the bridge in Delphi for the first time, it was a similar thing. We just felt very uncomfortable and very sad. And just, it was a very, it wasn't like a curiosity or like, oh, let's try to map out. It was just like a something yeah. really bad happened here. And we don't know why. And we're never really going to know, even if it's solved. Yeah. I was glad I wasn't doing it as a journalist because that part of my brain just kind of turned off. And I just felt like this is how I'm ground. Yeah. We, can't, we can't start adding crying to your podcast. That's just my podcast. <laughs> you, I do. Can't, you can't steal tears from me. <laughs> um, I do want to ask. So go on. <laughs> I want to go full circle back to yeah. like, just for um a moment, and it's just you know we. We talked about the Franks memo and some of what was in it. And and this touches upon the wider case, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, what's not in the Franks memo, but also just, you know, the amount of weird stuff that's happened in this case over time. Ron Logan, Kegging Klein, different leads that we may not even know about yet. It's and, very telling, yeah. right? It's very telling what's not in that motion. You don't see Ron Logan's story, so... You know the defense has access to a ton of discoveries, so that probably means there's nothing really incriminating in there about Ron Logan. Hagen Klein is not mentioned at all, so you can probably bet your arm that unless they're missing a giant piece of the discovery, which I have some idea that they have that part, there's nothing that they can use to point to Kagan Klein, and that kind of goes back to the point I was saying. This strikes me as a sign of desperation. Am I the typical juror? I have absolutely no idea, but I think it really runs the risk 
in the public where we have these, based on the information that we have, these suspects who look potentially viable like Logan or Klein, the fact that they're not in the motion tells you volumes about what the defense has and what they also don't talk about related to Richard Allen tells you volumes. One, two, three, four. Those are numbers, but you already knew that. If you want to know what number you're going to pay each month for your car, use Kelly Blue Book My Wallet on AutoTrader. They're really good at numbers. AutoTrader. The number one selling product of its kind with over 20 years of research and innovation. Botox Cosmetic, out of botulinum toxin A, is a prescription medicine used to temporarily make moderate to severe frown lines, crow's feet, and forehead lines look better in adults. Effects of Botox Cosmetic may spread hours to weeks after injection, causing serious symptoms. Alert your doctor right away as difficulty swallowing, speaking, breathing, eye problems, or muscle weakness may be a sign of a life-threatening condition. Patients with these conditions before injection are at highest risk. Don't receive Botox Cosmetic if you have a skin infection. Side effects may include allergic reactions, injection site pain, headache, eyebrow and eyelid drooping, and eyelid swelling. Allergic reactions can include rash, welts, asthma symptoms, and dizziness. Tell your doctor about medical history, muscle or nerve conditions including ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, myasthenia gravis, or or Lambert-Eaton syndrome and medications, including botulinum toxins, as these may increase the risk of serious side effects. For full safety information, visit BotoxCosmetic.com or call 877-351-0300. See for yourself at BotoxCosmetic.com. About what's in there. There's a lot they don't talk about him, so it just makes me wonder what's behind door number two. Where, where was he that day, namely? Yeah, you know. yeah. where was he that morning? Because if he was, like, out playing golf and hanging out and saving bunnies we would have heard about it where was he that afternoon where was his wife during the day right so you see what i'm saying like it doesn't mean that there's something nefarious there but if you're telling a narrative like that what you leave out you know particularly when it's a piece of advocacy is as important as where you put it and i do think people should take a hint from that I want to ask, like, is there anything else uh, that's just going around about Delphi right now or things that you think people are missing or should think more about or just change the way they think about the case in general? Um, you know, I know you follow some of the social media and people are always chatting about this. And I'm curious yeah. what on that. And I see things like um, justice for Abby and Libby on all sorts of posts, et cetera. I would just encourage people to um, think about, don't just think about the hashtag, think about the words you're saying above that, because some of it doesn't really have to do, Some of, a lot of what's posted has very little to do with justice for Abby and Libby, has really little to do with what, for uh, ensuring Richard Allen has a, a fair uh, trial. It has, you know, in my opinion, there are lots of different things. Some of it's sloppiness. Some of it is about ego. Some of it is just, I don't know. I don't even know what to describe all of the different things it is. But I can tell you, like in my mind, go ahead and use those hashtags and say those things, but go back and ask yourself, are those words right before it actually serving that? If that's your mission, if that's what you value, are the words you're writing serving that and i don't i don't see a lot of that well said i think unfortunately um the kind of contention that oftentimes the victims at the center of a case are the most forgotten um in all the media outcry and the social media outcry that's very true especially in this case in my view yeah and when i was at CrimeCon, one of the things that was passed along to me like one hop was that some of the things that in were in the defense motion the family didn't know anything about and can you imagine that i remember covering cases where like difficult details were going to come out in the paper like even before a trial and we would go and we would talk to the family about it and we'd say hey like this can be a two-part series if you don't want to know the details don't read part two or we would say look these details are gratuitous let's not put them in there i've seen cases where the prosecution has gone to the families and said look these horrible details are going to be at the trial tomorrow your choice to go or not, or maybe you should ignore the media, but to throw it in emotion, going back to the point about this media manipulation, emotion that should have been sealed, and that's the defense's responsibility, that was not sealed, 
And so the families could open their social media accounts, turn on their TVs and find the, find out the brutal ways that their sisters, children, um, cousins died. Um, to me, that part is a little callous. Like, we didn't need to know those details. We certainly didn't need to know them in an open motion. And I think a lot of people don't understand. A judge may decide what gets sealed, but it's really the prosecutor's and the defense attorney's responsibility when they're hitting that button to file it, to seal it. And I don't know whether it was a mistake not to seal it or it was okay for it not to be sealed or whether it was deliberate. But either way, you know, you got enough going against you when it comes to treating the victim as well as the defense. Like, they didn't need to make that error as well. Well, or or it was deliberate, or that was the point, because the media would cover it. Maybe that was the point. But then that makes me really wonder. Yeah, it's, 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 very, it's very, I mean, I feel like I'm a very, I feel like I've become very jaded covering crime, but I felt... Uh, ill reading that portion of it because um it was really bad it was uh oh no i don't think you're as jaded as, as, as jaded as you think you are <laughs> i'm just always talking out about how jaded i am but then i'm still like i'm still like oh i hope this works out you know <laughs> you still believe i can tell you you still believe in good and people well i really appreciate that jason <laughs> we're doing therapy now <laughs> <laughs> I, gosh, I, I, this has been so delightful. I want to, before we go, I want, where can people listen to your show? How can they follow you? Yeah, it's um, Silver Linings Handbook um, podcast. You can find it on all of your podcast apps. Um, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Always happy to engage listeners for ideas. I hope you know, the conversations that I have with people are inspiring, but I also hope that, you know, my door can remain open to listeners who want to talk about things privately or do other things like that. So, you know, people can check out the podcast. They can also reach out to me. I'm always happy because, you know, like I said, I kind of learned I'm here to help people and that's what I want to be able to do. So. Well, we, we want to just stress to our listeners that you should absolutely check out the podcast. It's yeah. awesome. And uh, follow Jason because he's a gem. Um, <laughs> and we really appreciate it. Uh, I feel the same way about you. Aw, thank you. <laughs> Shortly after we recorded our talk with Jason, Judge Frank Gull announced in court that attorneys Brad Rosie and Andrew Baldwin had withdrawn from the case and would be replaced. Now, of course, it remains uncertain what will happen next in the case. It's not outside the realm of possibility that Baldwin and Rosie could manage to come back. But when it looked like Rosie and Baldwin had definitely withdrawn from the case and were leaving it for good, we reached out to Jason to get his thoughts on that development. Well, I think it's a great opportunity for a little bit of a reset when it comes to the way the defense is interacting with the media. Um, I think it's an opportunity to move a little bit away from... I don't want to exactly call them conspiracy theories, but there's theories that really essentially, you know, are being offered that don't have a great basis in fact. Um, you know, I think for a lot of people in the true crime community, it's an opportunity to reflect. You know, um, a podcaster that I'm friends with, Brett from The Prosecutors, said, this is not a game. And that was the really, I think, powerful a powerful message to send. And it really resonated with me. You know, certainly in my experience when that picture of the F came out, I think a lot of people focused on trying to figure out whether it's an F. But I think for those of us who have been involved in these situations, who have talked to families in situations, all we saw was a victim's blood. And I think, you know, while the defendant does, and I think this is an important part, have a right to a fair trial, we need to, we, we have seen a situation here where both his right to a fair trial was harmed and the victim's families were further victimized. So, you know, paying less attention to these little puzzles that we could potentially solve and more attention to that blood that's been shed, I think it's a great opportunity for that. How can listeners who are following along with this case and, and definitely want answers, how can they balance that better with perhaps, um, you know, 
being empathetic towards all of this. And I mean, I think it's hard because I, I know as a curious person myself, sometimes I want to know things, but how do we maintain that curiosity while also not necessarily giving attention or undue attention to situations like this that could negatively harm a case? Yeah, I mean, I struggle with the exact same thing. I am an enormously curious um, person and I would love to know absolutely every detail of anything I'm curious about, whether that's how to bake a cake or a <laughs> um, true crime, you know, key lime pie. If someone could truly so give me- wholesome. <laughs> right, I would want to know every detail. But um, I think one of the things that I've found both in reporting and then also being someone who's interested in these cases is that not every fact I find needs to be shared. Not every um, thing that I come across needs to be repeated. And so sort of the ethic I take is what value does this thing add compared to the potential harm? And so, you know, while I am curious, I think what I really share is based on, um, you know, whether it's going to bring good in the world and whether that good is going to be more than the, the, the bad. What do you expect to happen next in the case? It's a really good question. I don't know. I sort of want to ask you that question. However, I, I do think at least from thinking about this from the perspective of the judge, thinking about this perspective of the, the media and some of the creators and all the folks who are, have now unfortunately become involved in this, I really do think probably the judge is going to tighten the reins in general on behavior, policing it. I would not be surprised if we didn't see new language, even functionally, if it were to stay the same around the gag order and around interactions. Um, I think that we're probably gonna get public defenders coming on the case. We probably are gonna take an opportunity to relook at everything. And this is not necessarily gonna get the conspiracy theorists to slow down their conspiracies and it might fuel it better. But what I do think will get a more responsible mainstream media, not that they were that bad, but a more responsible mainstream media, I think we will get closer to Richard Allen having a fair trial, and I think we'll get closer to justice for Abby and Libby. So as much as it's a bad thing, I also think it's an awesome opportunity to respect the rights of the defendant, respect the victims, and really, I think collectively for all of us, restart the way we've been behaving when it comes to this case. I think we all, all the people who are interested to have this opportunity to flip the page, open a new chapter. And it's just gonna require our humility, right? We've collectively done some things that are not so great, not so wonderful. And we can be humble about that by looking at this outcome and just simply asking ourselves, whether I'm Judge Goal or I'm Jason Blair, what can I do to really make this a fairer, better, more healthy, process. Really well said. And, and is there anything we didn't ask you about that you want to share with the audience um, going forward as we're kind of waiting to see what happens next? Well, I should throw in my bias that you guys, for my introduction to true crime podcasting, you led me to many of my favorite podcasts. I respect your journalism. I respect how balanced you are. I respect how you air all sorts of ideas and I think you guys have been in this darkness of this case, a real sort of shining light for a lot of us. You know, if I'm confused about what's happening or there are competing versions of it, it's nice to know that I can turn to Kevin and Anya and the murder sheet to get some clarity or sense of what's going on and just that I appreciate it. So. Oh my gosh. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. I mean, I did. That means a lot. It, it, we really. Don't cut been... that part out. We're not going to. We're, de we're definitely leaving in the compliments. No, um, I I, I want to say, Jason, to you that talking with you about this case has been incredibly cathartic and and therapeutic for us, and we just really appreciate you and and your level 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 headedness and also your sense of compassion. So, but one thing I can say that you guys have said, you know, on your podcast over the last few weeks and dealing with the case, and I know when you've gone in other forums, is you've talked about related to the leaker or even intimated related to the defense attorneys that we should give everybody a little bit of grace, right? We are all humans. We all 
make mistakes. Like one of the beautiful things about humans are our frailties. And I think just opening that door to have a little bit of grace, it doesn't mean that you forgive or you just forget every behavior, but that grace is what keeps us going. It's what keeps us connected. And I, I do appreciate the fact that you don't traffic in demons. You just traffic in humans with all of our complexities and frailties. And I appreciate that part. We would like to thank Jason for speaking with us. We recommend you check out his podcast, the Silver Landings Handbook Podcast. He's had some great conversations with people. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening. Look around. You can find cars like these on AutoTrader, like that car riding your tail. Or if you're tailgating right now, all those cars doubling as kitchens and living rooms are on AutoTrader too. Are you working out and listening to this ad at the same time? Well, multitasking pro, cars like the ones in the gym parking lot are for sale on AutoTrader. New cars, used cars, electric cars, maybe even flying cars. Okay, no flying cars, but as soon as they get invented, they'll be on AutoTrader. Just you wait. AutoTrader. Botox Cosmetic, out of botulinum toxin A, FDA approved for over 20 years. So, talk to your specialist to see if Botox Cosmetic is right for you. For full prescribing information, including boxed warning, visit BotoxCosmetic.com or call 877-351-0300. Remember to ask for Botox Cosmetic by name. To see for yourself and learn more, visit BotoxCosmetic.com. That's BotoxCosmetic.com.